Uh, this week we're going to talk about ground faults, and then next week I'm going to actually do a live demonstration. I'm going to try to set up a little display board that has uh, like a fire panel and a handful of different circuits, and we'll go over how to actually uh, do all the stuff we've talked about already using a meter to check these circuits, and we'll add some of the new stuff that we haven't done videos on. We have one um, all-inclusive uh, all inclusive video that shows you how to check your circuits before hooking them up to a panel. Um, also today I have a, a little 10 minute video I'm going to stick in the middle of this lesson instead of sending it out separate as an email. Um, I, it's, it's a really good video that explains how 110 electricity alternating current works. It talks about the hot neutral and ground. Uh, there's a part where it gets pretty technical about using a meter to measure potential voltage differences between hot and neutral and and it shows metering in the panel when you got two different hots coming in it's about a minute of that it gets pretty technical pretty fast we don't have to worry about that we're not high voltage electricians we never have to do that kind of thing in our line of work um, but just bear through that because it goes from that right into spending the rest of the video talking about earth ground um, and it does a really good job of explaining it so I'm going to use their video because they can probably explain it better than I can and, uh, and then we'll go and after the video, I'll talk more about how this applies to us as fire alarm and low voltage technicians. Um, before I start the video real quick, I just want to revisit our water hose example we've been using to explain electricity, where we have uh, our water pressure, which we equate to voltage. That's the, the pressure pushing the electricity through the wire. We have our current, which is the volume of water coming through the hose. So that's how much water is moving. That's, that's our current. He's going to use the term current a lot in this video. Um, current is what we measure in amperage. So if you hear people talking about amps, that's current. Those words get used pretty interchangeably a lot. So be very familiar with that. And then the third thing we talk about is our resistance. That's like if there's some sand in the water hose or if someone's pinching down on the, uh, on the hose itself, making some kind of restriction. That's the resistance of the circuit that's measured in ohms. Um, so just remember those three things, and I'm going to go ahead and switch over to the video real quick, and we'll get started with that. Hey there guys, Paul here from the engineeringmindset.com. In this video, we're going to be looking at the difference between the hot, neutral, and ground wires, as well as the function of each with some worked examples. This video is for homes in North America. If you are outside this region, then you can still follow along, but your system will work and look a bit different, so do check out our other videos. Remember, electricity is dangerous and can be fatal. You should be qualified and competent to carry out any electrical work. Before we get into this video, there are three things I need you to remember. Number one, Electricity will only flow in a complete circuit. If you come into contact with an electrical conductor, your body might complete the circuit. Number two is that electricity always tries to return to its source. And number three, electricity will take all available paths to complete the circuit, but it will take preference to a path with less resistance so more current is going to flow in that path. Okay. So we're going to be looking at the hot, neutral and ground wires for a typical North American residential electrical circuit. First, we'll see a really simple circuit to understand how it works. Then we're going to apply this knowledge to a complex residential installation. When we look at a simple electrical circuit with just a battery and a lamp, we know that to turn the lamp on, we need to connect both ends of the wires to the terminals of the battery. Once we connect these wires, the circuit is now complete and electrons can flow from the negative through the lamp and then back to the positive terminal. So for the circuit to be complete, we need a wire to carry the electrons from the power supply and over to the light. This wire is our hot wire. Then we need to connect another wire from the lamp and back to the battery for the electrons to get back to their power supply or from their source. And this wire is our neutral wire. The hot wire carries the electricity from the power supply and it will take this over to the load. The neutral wire carries the used electricity back to the power supply. If we look at a residential electrical system in North America, then we will find two hot wires, a neutral wire, and some ground wires. If you want to see in detail how this all works, then check out our video for that. Links in the video description below. 
Now imagine for a second that the home's electrical system is connected to a battery and we have just one hot wire and a neutral wire. As we saw with a simple circuit, for the light to turn on, we need a hot wire to supply the current to the load and we need the neutral wire to return the current to the source. Electricity therefore flows through the hot, through the bus bar and the circuit breaker and into the light. It then travels back through the neutral and over to its electrical source. Now, of course, homes are not connected to batteries. They are connected to transformers. So we're going to replace the battery with a transformer. And there we go. We have a complete circuit. The electricity in this circuit is AC alternating current, which is different from the DC direct current, which we saw with the battery. With DC, the electrons flow directly from A to B in only one direction, much like the flow of water down a river. But in our homes, we have AC alternating current, which means the electrons alternate their direction between forwards and backwards, much like the tide of the sea. Now in North America, we have a split phase supply to most residential properties. So we have the two hot wires and one neutral wire. We simply have two 120 volt coils, which are connected together in the transformer. The neutral is then connected to the center between the two coils. When we connect our multimeter between a hot and the neutral, then we're going to get a reading of around 120 volts. And we get the same reading for the other one. That's because we're only using half of the coil in the transformer. But then when we connect between the two hots, we get 240 volts because we're using the full length of the transformer coil. Now, if you don't have a multimeter, I highly encourage you to get one. Links down below for which one to get and from where. Now, if we have a load on only one half of the coil, and the load is for example 20 amps then the hot wire will carry 20 amps to the load and the neutral wire will carry 20 amps back to the source we can measure the current in the cable using a current clamp meter again links down below for which one to get and from where if you don't know what current or amps are then check out our video on electrical current links for that in the video description below also now if we have another load on our other half of the coil and the load is a different value say for example just 15 amps then the neutral will only carry the difference between these two values back to the transformer or back to the electrical source. So in this case, one side we have 20 amps and the other side we have 15 amps. So the difference between these is five amps. So the neutral will carry five amps. Where does the rest of this go? Well, it will pass through the two hot wires. Now this is what we have in most cases because there are multiple circuits with different loads in the residential property. However, if we had a load on both coils and they are of equal value, say for example, 15 amps each, then there will be no current flowing in the neutral wire. So where is it going? Well, it's flowing back and forth on the two hot wires between the load and the source. That's because it's AC alternating current and the transformer is center tapped with a neutral. So while one half is moving forwards, the other half is moving backwards and the current will flow into the other circuit instead of back via the neutral. Hopefully that hasn't confused you too much. If it has, then don't worry about it too much for now. We're going to cover that in a more advanced video. Okay, so the hot wires carry the electrical current from the supply and over to the load. And the neutral wires carry the electrical current from the load and back to the supply. So what does the ground wire do? The ground wire under normal operating conditions will not carry any electrical current. This wire will only carry electrical current in the event of a ground fault. Hopefully, this wire will otherwise never ever be used at all in its entire life. It's just there for an emergency path for the electricity to get back to the power source instead of it passing through you. The ground wire in most cases is a bare copper wire. It's uninsulated. But in some cases, it is covered with a green insulation. This wire has a very, very low resistance, so electricity will prefer to travel along it because it's easier and can get back quicker. Now, if we go back to the simple circuit with a battery and a lamp, if we now run another wire, we run this from the positive terminal over to the lamp and we connect this to the metal of the lamp holder, then this is effectively our ground wire. As you can see, it's not being used to carry electricity. If the hot wire touches the metal casing, then the electricity will now flow through the ground wire instead. If the hot wire is connected to both the neutral and the ground, then it will now flow through both wires back to the source. But as the ground wire has less resistance, then more current will flow through it. When electricity finds a way to leave its circuit and return to the source through a different way than its neutral wire, this is called a ground fault. Coming back to the house, the electricity flows through the hot wire and into the light and then back through the neutral. 
But if the hot touch is the metal casing, then it will instead flow through the ground wire, back to the panel, through the bus bar, and then back to the transformer via the neutral wire. The ground wire has a very low resistance, so it causes a huge and instantaneous increase in current, which will trip the breaker. We therefore connect the ground wires to anything that could potentially become a potential path for electricity to leave its circuit, such as the metal pipes, the metal plates on the light switches and the outlets of their boxes. We also need to run one to the outlets because often our appliances are made of metal or they're covered with a metal casing, so things like washing machines and microwaves. When you look at a receptacle and plug, you'll see that there is a hot terminal, a neutral terminal and a ground terminal. The casing of something like a washing machine is connected to a ground wire in the lead which goes to the plug, through the receptacle and back to the panel to save you from an electric shock. Now let's say you're outside with no shoes on and the ground or the soil is moist. If you touch a hot wire, you could complete the circuit and the current may pass through you to get back to the supply. In this case the resistance is going to be very high, so the current might not be high enough to automatically flip the breaker and cut the power. This will likely lead to the person's death. Luckily, we have the GFCI receptacle or the GFCI breaker. GFCI stands for Ground Fault Circuit Interrupter. We're going to look at the circuit breaker version, but essentially they're going to work the same. This GFCI breaker is going to be connected to both the hot and the neutral of the circuit, so we can monitor the wires and ensure that the current running in the hot wire of the circuit is equal to the current running in the neutral wire of the circuit. If the current is not equal in these two wires, then it's clearly flowing back to the source via another route, we then have a ground fault. The breaker will realize this and very quickly and automatically flip to cut the power and kill the circuit. Connected to the main panel, we will find a thick copper wire which leads out to a ground rod. The ground rod is buried into the ground outside near the property. This rod is not used for ground faults. Its purpose is to dissipate static electricity and external high voltages like lightning strikes. There is also a ground rod connected to the neutral at the transformer. Many people think that during a ground fault, electricity flows through their ground rod and into the earth. But remember, electricity tries to get back to its source. It doesn't just go into the earth. And as there is a ground rod at the transformer, then there is a potential path for the electricity to get back to the source. But this path will have a very high resistance or impedance. And as we know, electricity will take preference over the path with the least resistance. So as we already have a very low resistance ground wire, which provides a path directly back to the source, the ground fault is going to take this route instead. When it comes to lightning, the source of lightning is essentially the earth. So lightning is always trying to get back to its source, which is the earth. If lightning strikes the utility cables, it will flow along the wires to get to the ground rods of both the transformer and also your main panel. And it's going to do this to try and get back into the earth. If it wasn't for this, then it's going to blow all our circuits and it's going to cause house fires. Now, if the hot wire came into direct contact with the ground rod, then electricity will flow through the soil back to the transformer, but the resistance is very high, so the current will be low. This means the circuit breaker will not likely detect the fault and the circuit breaker will not automatically flip to cut the power. Okay guys, that's it for this video, but to continue your learning, then click on one of the videos on screen now and I'll catch you there. Are we back on? We can't hear you, Keith. Oh, see, that's a good. I was just asking people to try to keep microphones muted. Um, that was thank. That was helpful. Thank you. Um, I was saying uh, to be. We're not. Uh, 
we're not electricians. We're not trying to install breaker panels. So there was a lot of information in that video that was extra beyond fire alarm or other low voltage systems. Um, but it is important for us as low voltage technicians to understand how the systems around us work, how, how things are supposed to behave and, and why ground faults are bad. So we need, in order to know that, we need to know why uh, grounds exist, what they are, what their purpose is, and why we don't want to connect to them and things that are references to ground for two reasons. One, so that we can take steps to avoid connecting to them and also so that we can uh, uh, we can know what good ground references are during our troubleshooting points when we're at different different places in the building and we're still trying to chase a ground fault. We can know that the, the thing we're using as a ground reference will or won't be a good ground reference. Um, so a few things the video talked about grounds being uh, used for. They're, uh, they're, they're a safety kind of return that electricians use in their circuits so that if any of their wires make connection over to any other metal, it's, it gives it a way to return back to its source so that it doesn't try to go through a person. It doesn't try to electrocute and kill someone. It gives it an alternate path back. Um, it also talks a little bit about static buildup. It, it protects against static with, uh, talked about that with lightning, but it goes further than what the video talked about. We can also use ground for shielding on like audio circuits. Um, and that the, the shielding is the foil that you find in the wire. Then there'll be a little uh, bare metal braid that's against the foil. So when you strip the wire back, you'll actually cut the foil and you'll take the, the two different bare braids and you can twist them together, wrap them around the wire. And then we need to make sure we tape that up so that it doesn't make connection to parts of circuits we don't want it to. But that's how you would have a continuous shield through your wire when you have a junction. Um, also, the whole reason buildings have uh, these grounding systems is it, pre it prevents fires whenever you get uh, some kind of hot voltage or a lightning strike coming through and it might send voltage to parts of the building that aren't designed to have electricity flowing through them and may come in contact with flammable materials. It's going to take whatever path it has to take to get back to the source, but if we can provide it easier paths to direct most of the current, it's going to prevent a lot of fires. So that's another reason why buildings have grounds. And then that shielding that that helps with our audio circuits, it helps uh, reduce kind of crosstalk and interference and things like that. And uh, older fire alarm systems on the SLC circuits actually required a shielding so that the, the data could communicate to the smoke detectors and pool stations and stuff accurately without other interference. These newer systems have been redesigned and they actually don't want shielding. The shielding kind of acts as an antenna for other interference. So there's just a a little extra tip that I wasn't planning on getting into. Um, so to talk about why we don't use them with our fire alarm circuits. The first point is uh, the NFPA code book actually says don't have any connection to, to grounds. And there's a handful of reasons for this. Um, one is that since there is potential for other systems to have their voltage traveling through earth ground to get back to its source, there's the, the possibility that it could find that path through the fire alarm system and actually mess our circuits up. And since uh, fire alarms are a life safety device, we don't want that happening. So they, they put that in there so that our systems have to stay completely isolated, completely self-powered, so that in the event of an emergency, when things are going bad, when you have electricity going where it's not supposed to be and fire where it's not supposed to be, the, the fire alarm will continue to evacuate. It'll continue to notify the authorities. It'll continue to prefer, perform its emergency functions. Um, and then also it gives it the ability to interfere and send false signals through. You may have found yourself chasing some ground faults in the past and noticed there's been some other weird troubles on the panel. Maybe some devices coming missing and, and then checking back in, then going missing again, then checking back in. And you don't know why they're doing that, but you've also got a ground fault. Um, sometimes that ground fault can be picking up some interference from those other systems, from other signals in the building. And, uh, and sending that back to the panel and the panel is not sure how to interpret and it might be a very very low current signal so it's not hurting anything in the panel but it's not sure how to interpret the signal so you can get some weird uh, i'm sorry i think i just killed the video here you can get some weird uh you can get some weird troubles going on when you have a ground fault so my advice if you have a ground fault make that priority to get rid of your ground fault so that you know whatever other signals you have 
they're actually accurate and the panel is communicating the way it's supposed to. Um, and then from there on, I, we're just gonna talk about some ways to avoid ground faults. This is mainly going to be uh, targeted at um, installs just so that we have good practices. We can, we don't wanna have to spend a lot of our time on installs chasing ground faults. They're horrible, they're pain in the necks and they take a lot of time up. So if we can do just simple things while we're pulling the wire, while we're installing devices, anything we can do to, uh, to save time on our installs, especially avoiding ground faults, it's gonna save you headache, it's gonna save overall the company money. And when the company becomes more profitable, that's when things like bonuses or raises can happen. Whenever we're using all of our time to troubleshoot issues that shouldn't have happened to begin with, bonuses and raises are gonna be much less likely to happen. Um, so some of the points to say to avoid ground faults, uh, first of all, use bushings and grommets. If you're going into a conduit stub, we have, uh, we have bushings that go over the end of those. They're little white caps. You just put it right on the end of the pipe and it just, it keeps that sharp metal edge of the cut pipe from cutting into our wire. All the conduit is grounded because there's possibility for electrical wires to, uh, to have connection to that. So anything that electrical wires can have connection to is going to be a ground reference in the building. So that could be structural steel, conduit pipes, water pipes, sprinkler pipes, um, even wall studs and ceiling grids often have, have ground reference to them. So anything that can have the ground reference, we wanna put a barrier in between those and our wire to protect the insulation so that our wire stays good. So where we go into to like 1900 boxes or 40 boxes um, and we use the knockout, there's knockout bushings that we put in that act as just a barrier between that sharp metal edge and our wire so those grommets and bushings, making sure we use those, it's a real easy step to skip. Don't skip it, it, it saves us time and money in the long run. Um, another thing I wanna talk about when we're pulling wire, we wanna make sure we're using the right wire tension. If, if we let our wire sag too much, then people are gonna be bumping into it, it's gonna get smashed with other things, and it's overall a very poor um, install. We don't wanna have poor installs but we also don't want to pull it too tight. We don't want it so tight that you can pluck it and hear a sound. It's, we're not putting in piano strings, we're, we're, we're putting in wire. And if you stretch that wire too much, it actually starts to break apart the insulation and can ground fault against our own wire supports that way. Um, so if you have just a very, very small amount of sag between wire supports, that's okay. Uh, just don't let it be just giant dipping amounts of, of sag. Um, so don't pull that wire too tight. Pulling it too tight, trying to make it look too pretty can actually cause ground faults. Um, and on that, while we're talking about the wire supports, don't over tighten the zip ties. You know, these buildings are sitting still, they're not going anywhere. So we don't have to crank down on the zip ties like we're securing the load on a moving truck. Um, the only thing that's gonna move these buildings is gonna be a tornado or hurricane. And by the point that one of those is ripping the buildings apart, they're not worried about their fire alarm zip ties. Um, also make sure we avoid all sharp edges. This can be like the, the sheet metal flashing that we may find around mechanical stuff. It can be all thread that supports air handler units or supports sprinkler pipe or supports electrical conduit. The threads on that all thread, if we let our wire rest against it over time, will cut through the wire with just the natural vibrations in the building. Um, also wall studs or um, some of the building steel it's just, they cut it. They don't worry about sanding it down. It's sharp edges. So if, if there's edges there, we wanna avoid it with our wire. We want some space between that. Um, if you're going through a fire rated wall, it's code that we have to use sleeves to go through those walls. But if it's a, if it's a spot that you think, oh man, I see, I can already predict. Sheet rockers are gonna come through and screw my wire up right here. They're gonna do something to it. Put a sleeve there too, even if it's not a fire rated wall, just, Protect your wire so you're not having to go back and fix issues later. It's a lot faster and a lot easier to do it right the first time than to have to go back, find the issue, and then fix the issue once the whole building's already installed, when you could just put something there to protect your wire from the beginning. Um, and then lastly, when we're running our wire, we wanna run it up as high as we possibly can above other trades. Nobody wants to go as high as they possibly can. I know it kind of sucks to have to run wire higher, when you could get away with doing it lower. But if we're up higher, other trades aren't wanting to go higher. 
So that means our wire is out of their way. They're not going to want to touch our stuff. They're definitely not going to go up there out of their way just to mess our wire up. I mean, unless you like piss them off on the job, don't do that either. But that's a completely different thing. Um, you know, run the wire up high, put it in a space where nobody else is going to mess with it. And uh, that can help, you know, fix, fix your grounds. Um, and I already talked about the sleeves with, uh, with sheetrock. You know, if, if you think the wire is going to get pinched, definitely it doesn't take that long to put one sleeve in. So just do the one sleeve. Um, that's really all I have for today. Um, I want to give you all just one last little note. If you do find yourself chasing a ground fault this week and you're not sure how, uh, think back to when we talked about the Class B circuits. We talked about dividing the, the circuits in half. Use that same method for the circuit that you find the ground fault on. Just keep dividing in half to eliminate sections of the wire. But what you'll do to look for a ground fault with a meter, instead of just attaching your your black con your black meter lead to your black conductor and your red meter lead to your red conductor, you'll actually put one of your meter leads. I always do the black meter lead. I don't know that it matters. It's always worked for me to put the black meter lead to my ground reference. So that can be, uh, if I've got a water pipe nearby, I can just touch it to the side of the water pipe. That's always an excellent ground reference. Um, any kind of like electrical conduit or back boxes. Uh, ceiling grid. I've had some times where ceiling grid was a little bit spotty. Uh, but most of the time, ceiling grid has been pretty good. Um, sprinkler pipes are really good as well. They're just as good as water pipes, and they're in every single room. But just know that uh, painted surfaces, like a lot of the uh, a lot of the sprinkler pipes have painted surfaces on them. Paint will act as an insulator and not let your meter get a good ground reference. So if you can find like where there's a bolt for a coupler on that sprinkler pipe, that bolt will give you a better ground reference than anywhere else on that pipe avoid the sprinkler heads themselves. It's just an itty bitty little glass tube that stops all that water from dumping on you and ruining your day. Um, don't touch sprinkler heads at all. Just just stay away from those. Um, trying to think, uh, the, the back of lightings, like when you've got your fluorescent lights or your LED lights sitting up in your ceiling grid, the, the metal housings of those, finding where the conduit connects to that, um, those are good ground reference points. So put one of your meter leads on that and then you'll use your other meter lead to go between your conductors, whether it's your black conductor or your red conductor. It doesn't matter what color meter lead you're using, just touch it to one of them at a time. And you should see one of the two conductors will have a lower resistance reading. Oh, and I think I forgot to mention, um, make sure your meter's on the ohm setting, just like you're looking for an end line resistor. Uh, but you're looking for whichever side of the circuit has a lower resistance. That's the side of the circuit the ground faults on. And so if you've got your black meter lead on your ground reference, you know, your water pipe or building steel or whatever it is, your, your red lead, you can put it to your black conductor and you can put it to your red conductor. Because at that point, we're not checking circuit polarity, we're checking for ground reference. Um, so doing that and combining that with the breaking the circuit in half method and just continuing to eliminate it by sections of the circuit, that's going to be the fastest way to uh, find a ground fault. Ground faults are terrible. They can ruin your day. Sorry if you run across one. I hope you don't. Next week, like I said, I'll put that display up and I'll actually show you that method. With, so if, if listening is not quite your thing, you need a visual representation, we'll have one of those for you coming soon. Um, and with that, that's uh, it's kind of all I got. Make sure you sign in with the chat feature. You know, just send us a message. I saw some people just kind of waving their hand with like a little emoji symbol. That's fine too, because that gives us your name. Uh, make sure y'all sign in. And if you've got any questions, I'm going to stay here on the line for a minute to let everyone sign in. So feel free to ask your questions too. Hey, Keith, uh, yes, are you still there? Yeah. Yeah. I just want to let everybody know, hey, thank you for doing this, first of all. But not only do we do this for their education, we also do it for the, comp uh, the benefit of the company. So if you guys have a chance in your spare time, go back and review some of this stuff because I know it goes pretty fast. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that's that's a good note. In one of our first lessons we did, I talked about going to a dollar store and picking up a cheap notebook to take notes in. Um, that gives you an easy way to go back and review it. Um, also, all these videos I've been sending out come from the same source. It's on YouTube. It's the Engineering Mindset. 
they uh, they go much more in detail than what we typically do, but I thought for this lesson, having that video in would really explain it better than I could. So if, if you're if you're trying to remember how relays work, the engineering mindset, they have a really good YouTube video on relays. Um, really on just about anything we talk about and a whole lot more, they've got good videos on it. Hi, Keith. Yes, sir. Hey, so does that Brown fault? Uh, oh, I'm sorry, your microphone. I'm sorry, I'm not sure what you're saying. The, the ground faults. What about the ground faults? Does fault? that apply the same as the surge detector? Um, I'm sorry, can you ask a question one more time? The ground fault. Does that apply with the surge protector? Yeah, actually, uh, you can get a ground fault through a surge protector. If it's taken any kind of power surge, sometimes it'll short those circuits to ground. So if you're getting a reference between your ground screw and your and your uh, fire alarm circuit terminals, then that means that surge protector is bad. So what what is the best size for the ground fault wire and what is the best place to ground it? Um, if you've got access to go straight to some kind of ground rod or can get a ground wire from an electrician, that's always going to be the best just because they're, they're who grounds the building, so getting a ground reference from them. Um, if not, if you can shoot a screw straight into some kind of building steel like the red iron or something, that's always a good earth ground too, because they have that connected to multiple ground rods. Um, they don't really like it when we tie to water pipes, even though those are great grounds too. And as far as size goes, uh, if you get like a roll of the THHN from Home Depot, something 12 or 14 gauge is always, always big enough. That'll take care of the biggest power surges that we deal with. If, it, if it's a power surge bigger than what that'll handle, it's gonna fry our circuit anyways. There's no surge protector that'll protect that. All right. Yep. Yep. 